This is Duke University. Good afternoon. My name is David Jarmel. I'm the head of Duke's News and Communications Office, uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this session. Uh, if you haven't been back to Duke's campus for a while, welcome home. Uh, you've probably noticed a lot of changes while you've been walking around. Uh, and in this session, we're going to talk about one of the most important changes that's been taking place at Duke. But it's a change that you won't be able to see entirely while you're here. You'll need to set your sights a bit farther than that. Our topic is Duke's growing identity as a global university. Duke now has a global health institute. It has Duke Engage, which is sending hundreds of students every year to engage with real world challenges around the world. Duke has a medical school in Singapore, a budding campus in China, and programs stretching from India to Africa to Latin America. Nearly half of Duke students now study abroad. Back here on campus, the number of undergraduates from other countries has nearly tripled over the past two decades. And even in the online world, Duke's homepage is now telling the university's story not only in English, but in French, Spanish, Hindi, Arabic, Russian, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese. I can provide many more examples, and if you haven't read the cover story in this latest issue of Duke Magazine, I really encourage you to give it a look because it provides a compelling analysis of Duke's global ambitions and challenges. I also invite you to look at the magazine's back cover where you'll see an ad for the Alumni Association's annual Duke in Depth conference. This year, the conference will focus on Duke and global development. It will explore issues such as educating women in the developing world, providing clean water, improving healthcare, fighting poverty, and promoting social entrepreneurship. There will be lots of global food, global music, global dancing, and global fun. We'll also be celebrating the hundreds of Duke alumni who have served in the Peace Corps which will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. So the dates are February 24th to the 27th, and if you're able to come back to campus, we hope you'll join us. Today, we're gonna to provide you with a preview of that conference on global development. You'll, you will hear from three of the people who have been most influential in defining Duke's global agenda. To the, together, they've probably logged more miles in the past year than Coach K and the entire USA basketball team. They're going to tell you what they've been doing and collectively how Duke's borders and identity now stretch far beyond its home campus to almost every corner of the world. I'll ask them a few questions to get our conversa conversation started and then we're looks like a fairly intimate small group and uh, we'll open up the floor and hope we, hopefully we can all have a conversation together. So let me introduce them to you. Uh, starting from my left, Greg Jones is Vice President and Vice Provost for Global Strategy and Programs at Duke a relatively new position in which he serves as the university's chief international strategist. He was previously the, du the dean of Duke Divinity School. Mike Merson, next to Greg, is the founding director of the Duke Global Health Institute, the Wolfgang Jocklick Professor of Global Health, and a professor of medicine, community and family medicine, and public policy at Duke. Finally, Bill Bolding is the J.B. Fuqua Professor of Business Administration and deputy dean of the Fuqua School of Business, where he has been actively involved in the school's global expansion. And here's a question to get the three of you started. In his recent book about how global universities are reshaping the world, the author Ben Wildofsky refers to the trend of colleges and universities developing international strategies as the great brain race. So my question to all of you is, why is higher education going global? And why is Duke getting involved? Greg, you wanna start? Sure. Um, well, I think that the first thing to say is if there's a great brain race, it's not at all clear uh, if you look at the landscape of American higher education uh, what the course is or where the finish line is. That uh, it's actually a vi far more chaotic uh, picture uh, in terms of this. Part of it is that it's, it's the flavor of the moment uh, to want to be global. I was uh, a few weeks ago at the Fort Wayne International Airport. Uh, which, as near as I could tell from the flights going in and out, indicate that uh, there was a time once when they had one flight to Canada, and that's what merited the name International Airport. I think every college wants to be international or global, and in many cases that means they have one exchange program of a handful of students to some remote uh, region. 
I don't think that's actually what we're talking about or what Woldowski's really trying to get at. But a lot of universities uh, got into it largely for the money. They thought there were tuition revenues to be found. Newsweek last week had a story on the perils of going global in higher education, uh, focusing on Michigan State, for example, which had a, an undergraduate campus they established in Dubai, found out neither the quantity or quality of students were that strong, and ended up shutting down the program this summer at uh, great financial cost. Um, the reason that universities legitimately ought to be going global, and I think this is at the heart of Duke's strategy, is reflected more in the sense of what it means to have uh, the kind of quality of research that a university ought to have, and most importantly, what it means to educate students who are gonna become the leaders of consequence in the 21st century. In any vocation across the professional schools and the graduate school, but also whatever vocation undergraduate alumni are gonna go into, they need to have a global imagination. That's long been the case, but it's especially urgent now, and I would say that's true even if you're gonna work in Durham, North Carolina, just to think about the ways in which the interactions work. And so the best universities of the 21st century are going to be those universities that are genuinely global in their identity, that form students uh, with a global imagination and have faculty who have that kind of capacity as well. Mike, why is Duke going global? Hard to add to that. Um, I, I guess I'd emphasize more than add two things. One is um, Greg referred to the 21st century student, the 21st century leader. Um, I don't see how you can be a 21st century leader unless you have a global perspective. Uh, I, I, even today, and we're only in the beginning of the century, and uh, can you imagine as we go down the century, we, you talked about airplanes. I mean, you can be anywhere in the world pretty much in 18 hours. Uh, so I think that the student of tomorrow has to think global, uh, and I think the economic benefits are clear to countries who don't have universities that they need to have universities because that's the future, that's where they're gonna get their manpower. It's sometimes referred to as, in that same book, I, I wrote down a quote, economic success in the 21st century will, will run through college campuses. So, so I think that we, we, the, the student drive, like many things on our campuses, is, is clear. Um, I think the other issue, of course, is our faculty. Um, I don't know the exact number, but the last number I saw was 10 years ago, 25% of all research, of all publications uh, by U.S. faculty in journals, 20, that was 10 years ago, 25% had a foreign collaborator. And I, I think there are very few fields today uh, where you as a faculty member, as, as you do your research, that you're not, you're certainly gonna have most discoveries are done with collaborators, but more and more those collaborators are abroad. And so if one thinks of scholarly work, of research, to me it's inevitable that we have to think globally. Great discoveries today are made because of advances in the US, in Korea, in, in South Africa. They don't come just usually from one laboratory. So I think whether one thinks of uh, the student who's gonna be a future leader, one, one thinks of a, a, um, a an innovative and entrepreneur, an innovative faculty with great entrepreneurship and whatever research they're doing, one has to be part of a global university. I, I really don't think there's a choice. Um, and uh, sure, everyone's in the race. Uh, not everyone, but, but many universities are in the race. Seems like everyone some days. Um, and of course, there have been, as, as Greg mentioned, not all universities have done it right the first time. Uh, we're still learning. Uh, the key thing in my mind is to think of this as partnerships. I think whatever we do globally, certainly in global health, we think of it as a partnership. Uh, and I think we underestimate sometimes that our colleagues in China and India are sometimes way ahead of us in, in thinking how they want to build these partnerships. That's, that's what I'd add to the, to the mix. Bill? Okay, so um, I, I think there is a compelling intellectual reason why Duke University has to be a, a global university. And I want, to, I want to actually attack that through the parochial lens of the business school. So the, the fundamental mission of universities is they are built to address uh, the, the, the important issues in the world through research and teaching. 
if you look at business schools, I would argue that the world has fundamentally changed business, and yet business schools have underreacted to those changes. And so if you look at how business schools are constructed, they're constructed in a way where it's really a US-centric model. It's built around assumptions of capitalism and open markets. And I think all of my colleagues over the years as they operated in that world had an assumption that there was a contest of ideas between kind of capitalism and communism. And the notion was that centrally planned economies would ultimately collapse and therefore what it is we were teaching would ultimately prevail. And so with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the belief was, okay, now we have had happen what we expected, and yet things didn't actually turn out that way. What we've seen is different countries around the world have institutions and variations on the way they work that are fundamentally different from what we see right here. And so you have to understand those institutions in order to actually be able to do the right kinds of teaching and research. So just a simple example, um, Greg well knows that in Sub-Saharan Africa, some of the most credible institutions are faith-based organizations. And so if you are trying to do business on the ground in that part of the world, you need to be able to work through those institutions. Now where are you going to learn that in a business school? And so the, the point I want to make is this is where I start to get connected to other parts of Duke University, which is in order to attack the problems of business, what has become increasingly clear is that we have to connect to other parts of the university in ways that would surprise you through religion, uh, through, uh, through health certainly. So if you go to China and you try to understand what's happening in, the, in hospital systems in China, Mike has this fascinating issue of you have incentives that are in place there that you would think of as pure capitalism. They may be the wrong incentives. At the same time, you're in an environment where you have this, this oxymoron, in, in our view, of a, uh, a centrally planned capitalist economy. And so he's got this odd situation of how do I understand how to get better in a hospital system which has these centrally planned elements and these market incentives and again, where do you get answers to those questions? And I think there are two things. One is you have to be on the ground, you have to understand those institutions deeply, and you have to bring the university with you because these problems connect across different intellectual disciplines. So several of you have mentioned that uh, Duke is hardly alone among universities in uh, looking, looking beyond the United States. What are the special advantages that we have at Duke, or disadvantages for that matter? Uh, Bill, it sounds like you were, um, I'm inferring from that, that, that Duke's inter interdisciplinary character um, might be one of them, but I'm wondering what the rest, as you, as you look at all the other universities that are doing this as well, are, is there anything special about Duke's effort? I'll say, I, probably I'll, I'll take it from the perspective, I don't know how long you've been here, Bill, but I've only been at Duke four years, so I probably have a little bit more objectivity in that sense, I'd like to think. Uh, but I, I, I will say when I was being recruited here, um, I was at a, an Ivy up north. When I was being recruited here, I was told, oh, it's different here. It's a very collaborative place and people, you don't need a visa to go from school to school. And, and it, we don't have silos and, and faculty have joint appointments. And, and as Bill said, we work on common problems. And of course you hear things when you're recruited and you don't know what, exactly whether, whether to believe them or not. Uh, but I have to tell you, it's really true. And uh, I think what we, we're, uh, I'm proud to say that um, coming here for me was certainly one of the best decisions I've ever made. And it was to help start an institute. And what's been fun is that uh, in terms of the institute, yeah, it's a global health institute, but it's, it's an institute that involves all of Duke. It involves all the schools at Duke. Uh, it involves other institutes at Duke. It's bringing the expertise and the excitement and enthusiasm of our students and faculty to addressing some of the greatest global problems in health we have in the world. And what you can do it here is you really can do it here. People want to work together. The spirit of, of collaboration is, is true. There's enormous, uh, ex a, a lot of, uh, many examples of projects where um, faculty from different schools come together to address a problem. 
And that's really important in health because very, very few health problems are simply addressed by one specialty or one discipline. I mean, you, you take, um, take auto accidents, okay, that, that involves the car, it involves the road, it involves the driver. And if you just think how many schools and how many disciplines are involved in a safe car and a safe road and a, and a, and a safe driver, I could probably go through all of Duke and, and show you how every school's involved, or air pollution, or disaster relief. And, and to look at the world's problems, you need a university that has elements that are comfortable working together and like working together. And I think we bring that in a very ideal way. Part of it is our geography, because we can walk from, uh, from around the campus pretty much everywhere. It may, may seem like a small thing, but it's not. It's a big thing when you have to go through a town or, or, or cross a bridge. You know, sometimes it can take 45 minutes. So I think, to me, what we have more than anything else is both a, a, a history of, of interdisciplinary work, a history of collaboration, and a spirit uh, and, a, and a desire for faculty who, who want to do that. And that's a very special feature of this university. So I'd add um, a little thing that I've been thinking about how to try to state what I think is distinctive about Duke's strategy. And I, it, I describe it with the acronym uh, G-I-N, which comes out to GIN. Um, it was suggested to me given my previous job, it should have been G-O-D, but uh, you'll probably remember it better if you think that the preacher was talking about GIN. Um, the, the acronym is that the G is that it's a global challenges focus. As Bill and, and Mike have been talking about, it's focused around the big challenges that both permit and require collaboration across disciplines and schools. The I is it's innovation at the intersection of education, research, and engagement. And you know, Duke is a relatively young university, which means we have fewer hardening of the categories. Um, and so we're more willing to be innovative and to try new things, of which the Global Health Institute is exhibit A, of a really innovative approach to dealing with some of those kinds of challenges. And then the N is networks of embedded and connected institutions. And the embedded and connected metaphor is Bill's, actually, originally. But what we want to do globally is not just have a branch campus and then say, now we're international, but actually develop networks of institutions and relationships and what that does is create a virtuous cycle. That the focus on global challenges requires innovation, which requires you develop networks of relationships, which gives you a sharper way to focus on the global challenges, and it keeps that cycle going. I don't know any institution that's even trying to do two of those three things, much less trying to do all three of them. So um, I, I said before that, that the world has changed business and business schools have have underreacted. I think the flip side of that is that business is going to change the world. And uh, the, the world that we live in is a very complex and scary place. And so we all have an opportunity or a responsibility to think about we can either take this complicated place and make things go from good to better or we can stand beside on the sidelines and see things go from bad to worse. And I think Duke University has made a commitment to try to be in the game and make things go from good to better. And so the, the interesting part about that is, and I, I hate to be so parochial in all my answers, but, but I'm really not, I'm representing the university, is that the, the business school plays a very unusual role at Duke University, which is in most universities, the business school is literally separated from the rest of the campus. And, and it's separated by geography, and it's certainly separated intellectually. But if you think about my statement that business is going to change the world, it's, it is probably, and uh, here I may be biased, it is the place where we will see the most interaction around the world. And so if you think historically, and I'm a terrible historian, I'm not in the history department, that a lot of the interaction around the world was predicated on military action or it was predicated on religious, um, the spread of religions or cultural sharing and so on. But now in the current world, you see businesses that are operating here, there, and everywhere. And so there's a huge amount of interaction. 
there's a huge amount of interdependence that comes about because of that as well. And so as China is, is burning resources and creating a huge carbon footprint, it doesn't stay over China. And as we take resources out of the Amazon to fuel business growth somewhere else, the implications don't stay right there. They spread all over the world. And so that's my comment about if we're not careful, business can easily change the world for much, much worse. And the way that we can avoid that is to recognize the centrality of business in terms of this interaction, in terms of the interdependence, in terms of your loss of control about what you do in one place being affected by something that happens somewhere else, recognize all that and then work together as a university to say, what we really need to do is we need to have business and health together. We need to have business and environment together, business and engineering together. And this place, I think, is unique in its willingness to have those combinations. Okay, it's time for a little audience participation. Um, I, I have another question, but I need your help in helping to frame the question. So if you, if you were an alum, if you were a student at Duke at some point, could you raise your hand? So, all right, sort of kept that in. Hi, raise them high, okay. All right, now, if while you were a student at Duke, if you spent at least a semester studying abroad, could you raise your hand? Okay, so that was three, and it all looks like among yeah. probably the, uh, the younger cohort of, of the audience. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm guessing, what did we see, like 20, 25 hands? Greg, what do you think? Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, you know, you can do the math, it's somewhere like 10 or 15 percent of this random sample. And so now, uh, in the current student body, it's nearly half of Duke students are studying abroad. So here's my question, which is, as we look to the future, um, beyond just studying abroad or being in Duke Engage, how, how is Duke's global focus going to affect its students, not just in what they do while they're students, but in the kinds of lives they live afterwards? Well, I, I'll give you my, my vision of the Duke in, two, Duke in 2050, just to get, uh, get us started. It's a great question. We, we brainstormed a little bit, Greg and I, coming back from a meeting about that. Uh, I mean, to me, the greatest, I should start by saying the greatest mistake would be if, if we're not bold enough. I mean, th this is no place to, not to be bold. We have to, we have to, in my opinion, we have to accept the great brain race is real and there's a good reason for it, and we gotta figure out how we're gonna race. Can't do it all, we have to prioritize. But the Duke that I'd love to see in 2050, and I know some of you may shudder at some of this, but how about if we had a student body that was 40% from outside the US here in Durham? How about if our faculty, say 90% of our faculty taught a course abroad at once every four or five years at one of our campuses, one of our, let's say we had a bunch of campuses, you heard about Singapore and China, maybe we'll have four or five more by then. We can, I'll let Greg figure that out. Um, what if we had a situation where um, a third of our faculty actually lived abroad for at least a year? So can you imagine a campus where half the people you hear talking are not, or third or 40% are talking, English is their second language. And can you imagine a similar faculty makeup? And can you imagine students going abroad and taking some of their courses abroad and faculty teaching abroad? I know this sounds um, you know, a, a, little, a little like Orwell, but I think that's where the world is headed. Now that may be too far, maybe I'm reaching too far, but I, I think we're gonna see, you know, if we can put ourselves 50 years from now, maybe that isn't so far for the leading universities not just in the United States, but in the UK and China and elsewhere. I think, I think education is going to be globalized like business and like many other factors today. Now I know that's, I just made Greg very nervous with those projections, but, but that's my bold vision of, 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 a, of a global Duke 50 years from now. Uh, sure, let's open the floor to questions <laughs> and maybe tell us who you are. So, so I would just let others join in, but I think the, one of the most critical things, entities or support services that we need in a global university is IT. 
information technology and communications. Um, I, I think Bill can talk more about the business school has been out in front on this here at Duke in many ways. But I absolutely agree with that comment that, that uh, I think a lot of our courses could be blended courses, that term blending now, which is a course that maybe you get some lectures on site, say you're in China taking a Duke course, maybe half your lectures will be given by a, a, a Duke professor who's living in China, and the other half of your lectures and discussions might be with faculty here at Duke who are 12 hours time different but are getting up in the middle of the night or, or up early in the morning to give their class. I, I actually think that is going to be the most critical support that a global university will need, and I appreciate you mentioning that. Well, if you take the example, I mean, uh, the Bill ought to describe a little more the, the global executive MBA and the cross-continent MBA, which have pioneered a lot of these kinds of uh, efforts. But the, the business school has the HCA classroom in it, um, which is a really wonderful space that has telepresence capacity, three large screens. And we were actually in there where we had some people from China, some people from India, and people from San Jose, California, namely Cisco, uh, on the screen at the same time you could easily do a seminar where you could have a group of students in Delhi, India, a group of students in Kunshan, China, a group of students in Durham, where you could present a global health challenge. Then you could actually ask them to go work in teams and then come back and present their responses where you get intercultural engagement and discover different assumptions about the issue and nobody actually had to leave home in one sense. Um, but it, it transforms the character of education so that when we've been planning our campus in Quinshan, we've been paying a lot of attention not only to telepresence capacities in classrooms, but also in smaller team rooms where you can have researchers interacting uh, in those ways. It's going to be hugely important uh, going forward. Uh, my son spent the summer in Beijing uh, doing Chinese immersion as part of global uh, study abroad. He's a Duke junior. And, uh, you know, we Skyped about twice a week. It was the only time he spoke English all week. But it was, uh, you know, we had face-to-face -face conversations uh, on a regular basis uh, that were quite wonderful. I, I think that the, the demands of the future will simply require people to be more globally competent. And you're going to have to have people who are more comfortable crossing cultural and country boundaries because it's going to happen more and more. Whether you do that through affordances such as technology or you have programs like the, the Cross Continent MBA or the Global Executive MBA where you actually bring students into those locations, I think it matters a great deal that you understand what it means to be somewhere else, what it means to be a guest in another location, and what it means to be a host of others who are coming into your location. Those are real skills that will have a premium value as we move forward in the future. And so I think everything that, that Greg and Mike said is that we need to build a university that supports that kind of structure. Okay, yeah, let's uh, just open up for general discussion. We'll start over here, yeah. Yes, please. I, I think that um, the notion of humility is absolutely central to any intercultural engagement. And um, one of the ways I describe it is that the first thing you do uh, in engaging somebody who's different from you, in Durham as well as when you're somewhere else, is you learn to listen. Now the second thing you have to do when you learn to listen is actually learn how to ask questions that make the conversation worth listening to. So sometimes we think listen just means you sit back passively for whatever anybody else has to say. But framing the kinds of questions, and humility is really critical because what it means is when you enter into that relationship, when we go and talk with potential partners, part of what you want to find out is what are their perspectives on their own needs? Um, and how can you learn from that? And the humility presumes I'm not the center of the universe, that there's something I need to learn from somebody else. 
false humility is when you sit back and just think, well, I'll let them talk, and then I'll come up and tell you what I really think. But the, the sort of engagement and the image of being embedded and connected is that the first step you do is humility. The second thing, and this is really hard in an educational institution, particularly once you get a PhD, is to think that learning is something that's a lifelong project. That the first task of an educational institution isn't teaching, it's learning. And if we did a better job focusing on what we want our students and other relationships, what we want to learn and what we want to help other people learn, we'd have a much healthier posture in all of our engagements and when we think, I'm going in because I got something to teach you. Yeah, so I, I, when you say we haven't done that the last 10 years, Mike and I weren't sure if you're referring to Duke or just more generally. Well, no, so uh, I think it. I think you mean it a is, nation as a nation. <laughs> yeah, I think it is absolutely true. If you look at our uh, our colleagues or our peer institutions, that 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 the lack of humility has characterized the the global land rush in some sense. Which is, the idea is we have something, and and we're going to bless you with with our wisdom. We're going to project out exactly. We're going to project this out, and you're going to love it. And so, so Greg's point about the, this notion of being embedded, the first part of that is to have real humility, to go to a place not to project out or to take something out, which is even worse, to extract resources, but rather to be of the region, to learn about the region, to learn about the real issues that are relevant in that region where we could therefore learn and do things that would make us better in terms of our research and teaching. I just add in, in the field of global health, you, I think you would find this interesting. Um, it's over the past 60, 70 years, the field has evolved and even changed names. So it used to be called tropical medicine, okay? And then it used to be called international health. Now, both of those had a connotation of the rich helping the poor. It was us going, just engaging there, okay? And, and about five to eight years ago, the term became global health, and that's very significant because it puts us all on the same planet in the same way. And I think we're still a little bit too much on the foreign aid concept with our US programs. Mm -hmm. but, but I think the next phase of global health, which is coming on us very quickly, is a, is a, a partnership, the word I used before, where, where it's a, it's a, whether you're sitting in, 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 Mo in Tanzania or, you're, or you're, you're sitting in China or you're, you're sitting in Haiti, you, you are, you, you're all equal dealing with the inequities in the world. And we've got as much inequities here in North Carolina as you find in most countries of the world. So global health also starts here at home. So I think, I think that's a really critical point for our field as it's evolving. I've just come back last night from a conference of, uh, we have a consortium of universities now in global health. Um, now, you, last, if you, last year, just to give an example, we had 300 people show up. This year we had 900, and next year I think we'll have 2,000. Because the growth around U.S. campuses, we did a survey. There are now 270 universities in this country doing something on global health. Now about 75 are doing it really seriously with some kind of major education program, research initiative. And we're talking a lot about being careful because we don't want global health just to be something in the north. It has to be just as much in the south. Uh, and, and a lot of our conference was dedicated just to that topic. So, I, I, and I think the students, I hope the students coming from Duke, we have, you know, you learn when you go to these conferences, where are you unique, where are you behind, that kind of thing. And, and the, the area where we were clearly, one of our real unique features is our undergraduates. We probably have the, the strongest, or one of the top three strongest undergraduate activities in, in, in global health. And I think that's a critical, obviously, point of education because it's when students are, are forming a lot of their behaviors and understanding the world or not understanding the world. And I, and I, I think that is a very precious part of what we do at, at, at Duke and uh, building that and, and, and really working with our undergrads to be sure that they, no matter what field they go into, they can go from an undergraduate participation in global health into many professions, that's fine, but they should remember the things they learn here. And one of, these, one of the things is the spirit of partnership um, more than anything else, and 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 to you know not to be the ugly American that I grew up with uh, in in the '60s. So, I think your comment, I'm sure, is the same in business as well. I mean, it's the, the world we live in is not going to tolerate our ignorant our, our arrogance. Questions over here? Yeah.
Great question. There's, there's some, uh, there were some uh, 15, 20 years ago Japanese uh, universities that took over particularly some smaller struggling uh, U.S. campuses. But the truth of the matter is in most of the regions of the world, and, and there's a huge cultural shift happening. Um, our trustee, David Rubenstein, uh, was uh, interviewed on the Charlie Rose show um, a month or so ago, and he said in, by the year 2014, the developing economies of the world will actually exceed GDP of the developed economies for the first time ever. Um, by 2014, five years from now. That's how much things are shifting. So there's huge economic shifts. The trouble is, and this is part of what Mike mentioned in, in Wildovsky's book about the relationship between economic success and colleges, most of those countries are not interested in setting things up in the United States for two reasons. One, U.S. higher education is the envy of the world currently. Now, the Economist had a story not too long ago in which it suggested maybe that U.S. higher education is like the U.S. car make automakers was, were in 1950, thinking we were dominant and just about ready to be uh, eclipsed. But the second reason is that most of these economies actually don't have systems of, e of higher education that they could set up things in the United States. So that in India, for example, only 10% of their uh, population currently has access to higher education. The government's stated goal is they want to go from 10% to 20%. But their plan is to start 14 research universities, Duke-like universities in India. And I said to the deputy uh, chief of mission from the India uh, uh, ambassador's uh, Indian embassy, if you start 14 universities, research universities on a scale like a Duke or a Yale like that, how far will that take you from 10% to 20%? And he said it might get us to 10 and a half or 11%. Now, just think about what it would mean to try to set up a university, the scale of Duke, with uh, how many faculty do we have in, uh, across the, the university, three or 4,000? Uh, just, you know, when you think about the number of faculty, then the infrastructure, the buildings, quality, uh, they're not gonna be setting up anything here very quickly because they're really trying to work on what they can do uh, in their home context. And what they are eager for us is to be able to help accelerate those processes uh, because they think that there are ways to partner, as Mike was suggesting, that can really enhance and raise everybody's, uh, the rising tide will lift everybody's boats. So, so I think that, that we will see, to the, your, your analogy with the, the car market, we will see increasing probing in yep. our market Absolutely. Uh, with Absolutely. people coming in from the outside. They will do so because let's not forget that the U.S. is a part of the global environment. And so where is global here is anywhere. And, and so we should not be ignored. And we are not being ignored. So, for example, a French business school has just opened a campus here in the, in the research triangle. And so that's, that's going to happen increasingly. I think the other thing that, that I think is fairly predictable is that we will see low cost disruptive technologies come from overseas into this market. And they will probably be ignored initially because you'll kind of, it's the classic pattern with all disruptive technologies is that it's lower quality, we don't have to worry about it, we won't take it seriously. And then the next thing you know, they're there as a serious part of, of this industry. I'll just so tell question, you, question just tell one quick, oh, yeah, an, one quick anecdote. Um, a couple of weeks ago I was in Singapore and I had lunch with the, the provost of the National University of Singapore. That's the campus on which our medical school um, is, is, sits. And so we were just talking and I was telling him about our work at this budding campus in Quinchon. Well, lo and behold, he's got a budding campus in Suzhou 10 minutes away and this is the National University of Singapore, they're gonna wind up probably being our biggest competitor, okay, and they're from Singapore. So, I, and, I mean, I think, I think it's just a matter of time. I think we're gonna even see, eventually, Chinese universities expanding. Um, as a big, the, the recruitment that's going on, I, I think uh, you may know that, uh, what was it called, 935, or Project 925 or 935 from the Chinese government in the late 90s, where they decided to pick 10 universities and just put an enormous amount of uh, resources into them. The recruitment that's going on in China is remarkable. 
uh, thousands of Chinese faculty are going back home uh, and getting very good offers. I think, I think it won't be long, maybe 15, 20 years, where you will see campuses here in this country um, from, from Chinese universities. I, I do think it's not happening yet for the reasons Greg gave, but I think it will happen certainly by the year 2050. Yeah. Yes, a question over here. Uh, over here, yeah. Hi, um, I graduated in 2008 and I've been in Florida for two years now. Um, and I'm actually in the process of getting into business school. And recently, I, well, specifically, I think I'm looking for an MBA in business program. And I wanted to ask, like, I know that Fuqua has this big SF in um, the health sector management program. And one thing that I'm really curious about is that so I had some Fuqua and some med school in it. Um, You graduated too soon. <laughs> uh, two quick answers. Uh, the med global health is now in the curriculum of the medical school. A third of the medical students, you know, the third year of the medical school here is, uh, you take a third year, you do a research project. A third of the med students who come here now say they're coming here because they want to take their third year project abroad. We're building sites and finding sites for them to work. Uh, it's not quite that high yet. It's about 15 students per class. So our medical students are, are getting enormous opportunities. And then secondly, this, we're in a second year now of a Master of Science in Global Health, uh, which we're giving at the Institute. It comes through the graduate school. It's not an MPH, but it's quite similar. It's a Master of Science. It has a little bit more emphasis on research than practice. Um, and uh, we are open to joint degrees uh, with other schools on campus. We don't have yet one with, with, uh, with the business school, but. I, I imagine that will eventually happen. And the health sector managed program, I'm sure Bill will tell you, is, is going global as well. So I think if you came now, maybe there'd be more opportunities. Yeah. I, I would say stay tuned. We talk a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about my nephew just finished the uh, CE for the China Europe International Business School. CEEPS. <laughs> well, you should come back in February when we're going to well, have our Duke and Tufts. Let me offer a comment th th that, uh, that is so Bill doesn't have to just talk about business, but let me say something about both of the last two comments and questions. One of the things that I think is really critical for Duke as a university, Fuqua has been out in front two years ago launching the idea of a globally distributed business school with programs where students in, uh, in their programs will be identified with key regions of the world. Um, and, and really was pivotal in that way. Now part of that was a defensive move because places like INSEAD, uh, the, which is uh, in its origins a French business school, is going global and has campuses in lots of uh, places. But the creative part of what Fuqua was doing that I think is really significant, and Bill alluded to it, is that Fuqua was bringing the rest of the university along. And so INSEAD, when they're in the Middle East or when they're in Singapore, they're a standalone business school. And what they can do is what the resources of their business faculty have to offer. But if you take the principle and premise of global challenges, the best business schools of the 21st century are going to be intrinsically connected to universities that bring other kinds of uh, disciplines to bear, a global health institute, a school of engineering. INSEAD can't do that. SEEBS can't do that. 
they're really good at business schools, and if you could isolate business problems, they'd be really significant. But what Fuqua has done, and, and it's really because people like Bill and Blair Shepard, the dean, are really good university citizens. And that's not typical of a lot of business schools. You know, the, there are all sorts of lines about, you know, the, uh, the gap uh, that be between where Harvard Business School is and the rest of Harvard, and you know, um, those metaphors aren't just metaphors; uh, they're realities at lots of universities. And so I think that's a real distinct advantage Duke has. But it's also the case that medicine often, and even a global health institute often, uh, they'll think of it in narrowly medicalized uh, terms, and that's clearly not the way in which um, uh, our health uh, focus is is developed and so it's you know even though we have a medical school in Singapore that Mike oversees they're eager for engineering to participate eager for business to participate because that's actually the best way in which you're going to prepare the physician leaders of the future so let's take some more questions yeah one back here I'll offer, uh, I'll offer three and very different, well, I'll offer four very briefly. Um, and, and one will sound odd given that we don't have much faculty strength in it. I'd say the first thing is health, uh, that the disparities in health, I think that if you, uh, that that's just a critical issue that we've got going forward. I think any developing culture, and I include the United States in this, is gonna need to have things at the intersection of health, um, business development, a healthy economic environment, and education. So those are three of mine that I think only what I'd say in terms of business is it's got to be entrepreneurship, and I mean both commercial and social. Uh, we've got to get much better at building programs and institutions. Uh, and so I think if we're not developing an entrepreneurial spirit in our approach to just about every sector uh, imaginable, then we're going to find ourselves uh, problematic, and, and that's critical. So health, entrepreneurship as a way of thinking in creative ways. Um, you know, Muhammad Yunus gave our commencement address. There's a really creative entrepreneur working in really interesting ways to address deep social needs. Um, and then the fourth, uh, an education, which is the one that I think is odd because we don't have an education school. I actually think that's an advantage for us. Uh, because it means we can think creatively without inherited assumptions about what kinds of schools need to be developed. And the fourth I just mentioned is probably in some ways the largest. If we don't develop a sustainable energy and environment uh, set of issues, uh, Bill alluded to both the, the problem of China's carbon footprint, but if you think about you know, two-thirds of the world's lung quality is dependent on what happens in the Amazon forest and what happens in the coral reef in Indonesia. We've got, we can all drive Priuses and we can all try to reduce dependence on foreign oil and it won't make a tinker's dam worth a difference unless globally we're taking seriously how to have economically viable, sustainable energy that doesn't do irreparable damage to the environment. That's a global issue. So those are four I just highlight. I mean, I actually think that the answer, I like your answer a lot and that the, the umbrella over those is in some sense development, which is how do we make sure that the, the world develops in a way where, given this fragility that I referred to before, that we keep things moving in a positive direction uh, rather than have things fall apart. And so those areas are actually, whether you call Duke University a global university or not, those are, are, are core areas where the university wants to make a difference. Okay, question over here. Stay in it's our problems in Durham, too. <laughs> I thought you would recognize that. <laughs> 
share with you some observations on that on this issue um, so President Bush started something called the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief this was 15 billion dollars that he put in to uh, it was to 80 countries but most of it went to 15 countries 13 of which were in Africa and this was to deal uh, starting around 2001 to 2006 2007 with the horrible amount of people dying from AIDS. So it, about three years ago, there was a survey done by the Pew Foundation around the world of where the U.S. was most popular. And you know, we were most popular in Africa. And one of the main reasons we were popular was because of that program. If you then, when President Obama took office, he increased that amount from 15 billion in over five years to 63 billion over seven years. It's now, of course, new presidents, new names. It's called the Global Health Initiative. And it's been expanded beyond AIDS to mother and child health and um, neglected tropical diseases, one or two malaria, tuberculosis, one or two other things. But the interesting thing is it, it also remains, like PEPFAR, one of the few pieces of legislation in the Congress that's bipartisan. And it, it, it is, most of the money is actually not coming through Health and Human Services, but coming through the State Department. And Hillary Clinton gave a, br a brilliant speech two weeks ago at Hopkins on this initiative. And what was interesting is she was quite honest and pointed out, yes, some of this is um, because we're, we're good guys, you know, we, we're trying to do something about poverty. And President Obama said the same thing in New York yesterday, if you read his speech at the Millennium Summit, Millennium Goal Summit. But also it's part of our diplomacy and it's part of our security as a nation. Obviously, if we have a lot of bad bugs out there, we, you know, bad organisms, that's not in our interest. Uh, SARS or HIV or flu. So I, I think... Uh, this has led actually to a new field called global health diplomacy, and the, and and many of our people, in, uh, many of our ambassadors now are quite savvy at seeing how global health uh, can be a, an important arm of the State Department. Now, I'm not saying we should do things only for that reason. I'm only pointing out, though, that sometimes when politics fail, uh, health can bring uh, peace, and people can work together. And you can see it in the Middle East; it's just not talked about a lot. There are a lot of nations in the Middle East collaborating all the time on health, on health issues that politically they would never say it too loudly. So I don't, I don't mean to in any way minimize what you're saying, but I, I, I do think it's quite interesting how the field of global health, besides reducing health disparities, in, you know, it, it ha has already and I hope will continue to make the, the planet a safer planet. So I just would add that to part of the dimension of what we're doing in health. So I have a question, which is, this all sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money. And I'm, I'm guessing some people may be politely sitting here thinking, so what happens to all the other programs at Duke if we're doing all of this global expansion and what happens to the campus here and everything? Uh, Greg, do you want to address that issue? Good. Yeah. Um, well, I think that uh, that's part of the perils of going global story in Newsweek. It was uh, part of a New York Times op-ed that actually suggested that universities' global strategies were going to become the new version of subprime mortgages that would sink the economies of universities in the U.S. And part of his argument was that, uh, at least according to that uh, uh, article, NYU has taken out $2.2 billion in debt to finance their global strategy. Their endowment is $2.2 billion. So in other words, they're betting the whole farm, so to speak, on their strategy. Um, that's not Duke's strategy at all. Um, our work is being done not by making significant financial trade-offs where we say, all right, we're going to take away money from core priorities in Durham, and so um, uh, 
this unit or that school is not going to get as much money because we've got to pay for the global strategies. For us, it's a matter of uh, growing the pie so that our campus in Quinshan, we're building on donated land. They're paying for the cost of the construction of phase one of the campus uh, of 650,000 square feet. Um, and so it's finding new partners and new relationships. The Singapore NUS, uh, uh, I mean, the Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore was funded by the Singapore government. Um, and they've just, uh, they're just going through the next round of uh, conversations for continuing funding. Um, we've got a lot of alumni, surprising number of alumni and parents of alumni who are living abroad, often who have significant amount of resources, but they haven't wanted to send their philanthropy back to Durham, North Carolina, because most philanthropy stays somewhat local. People want to help their immediate region. Well, now if we're doing something in China, our Chinese alumni are going to be willing to support it more eagerly because it's actually going to help their own local and regional context. So there's lots of opportunities uh, to grow the pie. And so um, it's clearly the case that in the wake of the 2008 uh, economic downturn, universities are even more financially strapped than they've ever been, and Duke is no exception to that. The only way in which we're going to be able to make this work is to grow the economic pie, not to look at trade-offs. That being said, I'd add one other note that Bill could talk more about in terms of Fuqua. We will make progress on every front more effectively if we don't think of what we're doing as an add-on, but as a reprioritizing of how to do what we already see as our core. If it's just like bolting the new programs onto what we do, we'll never be able to afford it even with external money. But part of what Fuqua's done is their whole identity as a business school has required them to take the revenues they already have and reprioritize them because they think that being a global business school is intrinsic to their future. Duke needs to do that as well. Bill, before you answer, we, it sounds like we have a follow-up over here. We are, uh, we're committed that wherever we are and offering a degree, it will be a Duke degree. Um, now, whether you say Duke brand, I mean, the medical school in Singapore is Duke hyphen NUS. Um, but we're committed to wherever we are doing it at a Duke quality and not in a knockoff way. And so everything we do is to be a Duke uh, quality with Duke degrees to be, to be offered. So... There, there's, a, there's another part of your question that I think is really important. It's not just the financial implications, but it's really an attentional issue, which is if, if you think that everybody is spending all their time worrying about what happens in China or worrying about what happens in India and so on, what's happening right here? And, and so for the business school, what I can tell you is the reason we want to spend time in China is because of we want to do better right here. That, that those investments have a direct payoff for every program that we run for students who want to come to this campus. Because if we can't help students understand China better when they're coming to this campus, we are not going to be preparing them for entering into a global economy where China is a huge, hugely important part of that economy and, and then go on down the list. And so we have, we have never separated, we've never said we could do this or that in a priority sense. We're saying we need to do all of this to make sure that our quality goes up. And so kind of the, the major objective in, in terms of our management philosophy is how do we make things better for the business school and for Duke University broadly construed. Okay, maybe we'll take two more questions, one over here. Well, let me. Well, the Ivies, you know, are in the business of protect, protecting their brand. So, um, and some of the Ivies, anyway. And I, but I think they, they are doing it, but perhaps not as boldly. You may have, you may have read uh, last year, last week, I believe, or the week before. 
there was a lot of press around Yale University, which, um, it's interesting, it was just signing an MOU, but it looked like they had done more than that. But they basically signed a memorandum of understanding with, with actually the same place where our med school is, in Ashley University of Singapore, to have a campus there, so-called campus, with a thousand students. Um, and, but a lot of those faculty were going to be recruited from the region. But perhaps most interestingly, they were not, apropos uh, Greg's last point, the degree was still going to be an NUS degree, not a, not a Yale NUS degree. Now, Yale may have very good reasons for doing that, and I'm not criticizing Yale. I'm only making a point that I, I think what you'll find with the Ivies is certainly, I mean, Stanford, Harvard, certainly, I mean, they're there, particularly their business schools. Bill can comment on that in particular. But it's a more cautious uh, in general, um, and, but, but they're there. They, they, they're, they've got to be in the same race. Uh, they know it. Well, I'm not with the winner. I don't it's know about winner. Race. We've got to look a long, long race. <laughs> yeah, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Right. But but Harvard's Harv the dean of Harvard's business school rather inexplicably while I was in India, and and the dean of the business school Great is story. an Indian, uh, and he publicly announced that Harvard Business School was not going to establish campuses in India or China. Now, why you'd go public to say what you're not going to do struck me as a very bizarre thing for a leader um, in his early days in office. He's a new dean. But it was the talk everywhere I went in India was this shock and dismay that Harvard had decided not to do this. Now, I would have thought you'd, it would have been in his self-interest to say we're going to be cautious or we're going to you know, experiment. I mean, there were a million things he could have said, and instead he led with we're not going to do this which did more to damage Harvard's brand among the people we were talking to in India than anything, I mean, I, you were grateful. oh, it was amazing. I mean, it was just kind of like, <laughs> here's the silver platter for you. I, it, it was astonishing. I think the boldest experiment is the NYU ex uh, experiment. Yeah. Opening up an NYU campus in Abu Dhabi. If you, yeah. New York Times has run some stories but on it's that. A very, but it's a, very, it's a very bold experiment, but it's a really scary one if I were an NYU trustee because it's dependent on uh, John Sexton, the president, who's flying over there every other week. And he's late 60s, and you know it, it doesn't look like it's a whole university commitment. It's been driven by his vision. He may be able to pull it off, but boy... Okay, we had, did you have one last? One last note. Uh, for me anyway, uh, first of all, I just found out about this thing in February. Whenever that is, I'll find out. But within the last 10 days, I was in China with a 36 flight. And I was surprised pleasantly that the little baggage bag that I carried on my carry on has written university on it. And uh, these Chinese who are still in their beds in hotels with their heat all the time. <coughs> It didn't hurt that our coach, it didn't hurt that our basketball coach got a gold medal there for the Olympic team. <laughs> and there were 300 million Chinese who play basketball. Right. <laughs> no, um, I, think, uh, I think that's, it, it is an important, uh, it is an important theme. We're not that well known everywhere. And, and we want to be such, not just by, as, as Bill described earlier, not just by projecting out but because people see that we're serious about what the educational challenges are and we're trying to be of service globally. I think if you th take that, your question about the fractionalizing, it has a lot to go back to your question about humility, that the more that we help create and educate people who will become leaders who have the kind of humility, um, that that's how they learn and have the kinds of ability to think across sectors the better our world's going to be all the way around. And we've got to do that in the ways in which we relate globally and establish what it means to be Duke University. If you think of Terry Sanford's famous description of Duke as a place with outrageous ambition, um, that's true, but it needs to be something that we, are, that we embody in a humble way. 
So uh, I'll close, um, just since you mentioned again that the conference in February, um, in part, I just wanted to take a moment to, to, to say how this came about. So we're calling it a world together, and it started, uh, I'm a for I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and there's a number of us on the campus who are former Peace Corps volunteers on the faculty and staff. And we, we got together and we were talking about how do we, what's the best way to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Peace Corps, which is coming up this year. Um, and you, the more we talked about it, the more we thought, you know, it's, it, we don't want to just have like a nostalgia event, you know, from 20 or 30 years ago. We, we, we look at where we're working now and we see all of the things that you've been hearing about for the past, past hour. And it's just remarkable what's been happening at Duke. I think you've gotten a flavor of that over, over the past hour. And we thought the best way to celebrate Peace Corps and the idea of a world together is actually to, to shine the light on all the changes taking place at Duke. Um, and I, I hope you've learned a little about that. Hope maybe you'll come back and join us. But in any case, um, I hope you've been inspired um, by the knowledge that we're, we're in really very good hands from the three, th three folks you've heard from here and the others leading this. And uh, join me in thanking them for Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.